prayer differently this morning. They can coach me later on. Can you grab the hand of the person next to you? And we're going to pray in twos or threes or however you have it. Even if it's ones, we're fine. We're fine. But I do want us to call on the name of the Lord together. And for the person's hand that you're holding, we want you to start praying for them. Don't pray for yourself. Pray for somebody else, all right? Father God, in Jesus' name, we love you and we thank you, oh God, for being who you are. We appreciate you for giving us the opportunity today to come into this building and to call on the name of the Lord together. Father, I don't know what need, oh God, that the other person needs, Jesus, but they are at the right place for the need to be met. We know that you are able. We know that you are, that you can do anything. The impossible is possible with you. And we pray for them, oh God, that they will receive exactly what they're looking for to happen in their life. Oh God, whatever it is, oh God, we pray that you meet and supersede that need, that it will be for the glory of you. Now, Lord, in this place, oh God, we pray, oh God, for those that are coming in that need a touch from you, oh God. We pray for that touch. That need salvation, oh God, we pray for their souls. And Lord, those that have whatever issue, whatever disability, we pray, oh God, that it ends today. Father, because in you there is nothing that you can't do. In you there's nothing short. And oh God, we pray, oh God, that everything be for you. In Jesus' name, we love and praise you. Can you put your hands together? Hallelujah. He's a wonderful God. I guess I finish it. Anybody have a scripture? Yeah, our first lady, she's going to come and read our scripture. Amen. In your hearing, I'll read Psalms 24. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend, in, who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord or who shall stand in his holy place? He who hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them who seek him, who seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory, Selah. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. I don't know about you, but I was happy about that word this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Did everyone get a smile coming through the door? Come on, who didn't get a smile? Oh, I got one for you. I brushed my teeth this morning. I am ready to pass this smile right on. Are y'all ready? For those who didn't get a smile, turn to your neighbor.
want to make sure that you know that you are at the right place, at the right time. Are you guys ready to, to worship with us? Man, Sister Angie's been hitting us this morning to making sure that we get these songs right so you guys could be a part of all that we do. So I want to apologize to you if she don't start directing out here. Just in case, I got to let you know she will do that. But we have come into the presence of the Lord today to give him glory, to sing unto the Lord, to clap our hands unto the Lord. Are you guys ready? All right, let's go.
everybody excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Hallelujah. We're just here to give him his praise this morning. Praise that is due. We are singing some choir songs this morning, but we know that they're oldies and good, but goodies. And we know that you don't, so sing along with us, okay? Don't be afraid. They're super simple. You can pick them up very easily, okay? The next one is Jesus Promised. Jesus Promised. Hallelujah.
song matter birth. I don't know if I can sing the next one. <laughs> this next one here, this is just a worship song. Can we just lift our hands and worship him this morning? Can we just lift our hands? Come on, all over the room. All over the room. Come on, God's house.
house today and he's looking great in that three-piece suit that he has on so I know he's gonna come take this mic out of my hand and he's gonna talk to us aren't you glad to have a leader like this I am so glad to have him this morning it is something special to have him here and I'm gonna have him to come and introduce our speaker everybody. Hallelujah. We thank and praise the Lord for all of you that are here today. And this is the first Sunday in September, so we want to acknowledge all September babies. Amen. Bishop's birthday is this month. How many other? Deacon Manley back there. Hallelujah, Brother Mike. Oh, all of you, stand up so we can see you. And, any, and, if, you, and if you're having an anniversary too, a wedding anniversary, you can stand also. Amen. We thank and praise the Lord for all of these September uh, occasions here. And we pray that the Lord will bless you with many more birthdays and anniversaries. And to all of our visitors, we just like to say praise the Lord and welcome to God's House Church. We pray that you felt welcome when you came through the door. But if not, this is a form of greeting to let you know you're always welcome here at God's house where everybody is somebody and Jesus Christ is Lord of us all. We also want to welcome those that are viewing on your own your mobile devices and we invite you to come and be in the sanctuary with us. This is a church that believes in worshiping and praising our Lord and our Savior for he is the King of Kings. He is Lord of Lords and he's worthy of all praise. So today we just want you that are here to join in with us as we lift up the King of Glory. And for those of you that might be looking for a good church home, check us out. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. I'm excited. I'm excited today because this month is my birthday. I'm going to do something that I've never done in the 40 years I've been pastoring. I've never taken off a month for vacation. And the reason behind it is I'm getting a little older. But I had a dear friend I talked to him last week. We talked about 45 minutes. Elder Jason, about golf. I told him, I'm going to whip him. You'll never whip me again. We were just going back and forth. And I got a call this week that he had a stroke. And I said, wow, he's in the perfect health. He walks nine, 18 holes five days a week playing golf up in Pennsylvania, that area. And he had a stroke. I said, Lord, you try to tell me something. Now, I'm going to be at church, but I'm not going to do nothing. For the whole month of September, I'm going to celebrate. I've never done it. I've never done it. I'm just going to take it easy. I'm going to walk slow. I'm eat a lot of greens, a lot of fruits and vegetables. I'm just going to take it easy this month, but I'll be here. And I'm just a little sad, my dear friend died, uh, Governor Bill Richardson. I don't know if uh, Mr. Lewis, you want to say something about him? Okay, come on, Mr. Lewis. Mr. Lewis, you come on up here. I really honored Governor, former Governor Bill Richardson. He appointed me to the um, Martin Luther King Commission. I was that for, I think, three terms. He left me there. And I didn't ask him, but he was a dear friend of our own uh, Mr. Lewis, who was the treasurer for two or three terms. Say something, would you please? I appreciate it. So I'm going to put you on the spot here. Say good morning. Good morning, Saints. Good morning, Saints. Good morning. All right. Uh, just want to say a couple of things about uh, the Honorable uh, Bill Richardson, who served two terms as governor of the state of New Mexico. Uh, but he was also uh, ambassador to the United Nations. He uh, served as the secretary of the U.S. Department of Energy, and I actually had a chance to work with him at the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, the, he got me appointed as assistant secretary of the U.S. Department of Energy. So I worked out of Washington, but he did a lot for this state. And he did a lot that he believed in uh, trying to, people that have been wrongfully accused, 
uh, going around this country and around the world trying to get them free. And so he had a dedication, he had a commitment uh, that he wanted to do the right thing. And as a governor, you know, it's not very easy because you got everybody knocking on your door. And uh, so I just wanted to say in 1978, uh, when he came to this state, uh, there's been some, uh, what we say, a lot of the famous individuals. Uh, we had uh, Vance Hartke, who was a national figure. His son, Jan Hartke, came here to, to run, and he became our attorney general. We had uh, uh, David Russ, uh, who was the uh, 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 national figure. His son, um, Dean Russ, Dave Russ, came here, and he ran for mayor. He was our mayor. So uh, Richardson did the same thing. He selected a place that he thought he could make a difference because he was actually born and raised in San Diego, moved to Mexico. His mother was from Mexico. His dad was a banker from San Diego. So he was bilingual, and uh, he was just a real asset to this state and to this country and to this world, and he's going to be missed sorely. So thank you, Bishop, for allowing me to come and have a few words on his behalf. Okay, yeah. Well, if he has his funeral here in New Mexico, I'm sure going to come because he blessed this church. He helped us with some grants over when we had our charter school. Next week is a special week, a special week. We have a group coming, and Elder Fadif's going to talk about about 40 kids. i got a guest preacher all the way from Chicago, Bishop White. I'm better looking than him. I'm taller than him. And he's going to preach. I think he's a better preacher right now than I am because I won't be preaching next Sunday, but he'll be here. You talk about having church. We're going to have some serious church next Sunday. I want you here. With that in mind, uh, as, as I said, I'm going to be off the whole month. Now, I'm going to be up here probably. I'm going to sit out in the pews and enjoy myself. I'm going to take off my suit, put on my jeans, maybe my tennis shoes, and sit in the back with my hat on backwards like the young people. Is it Sharon? What's your name, dear? You that I hugged this morning. No, behind you, on the back row. Your name? Tanya? Tasha. I hugged her, and I told her, I like young people, so I'm going to sit with you next week, okay? Because you get around old folk, they always hurt like I do. <laughs> but we got a young man that's coming today. I kind of love this guy. He looks a little bit like his mother. A little bit like his mother. He's been in our family for some 40 years plus. He's a good preacher. He's a good preacher. I think he got the Holy Ghost at 12 or 13, 15. His mother made him tarry for the Holy Ghost. But he's coming right now. He's going to be in charge. He's going to call the preachers and teachers for this month. Give Pastor Shelby a hand praise as he comes. Preach the word. Praise the Lord, everybody. Truly be kind and honored and privileged to be here. I want to make a special announcement that for our next week, we're going to do a special offering. I want everybody under the sound of my voice. In fact, Bishop, come up here and get this now. I want everybody that can next week, we're all going to give $50 to our leader for his birthday, which will be on the 15th of September. So I want everybody to bring their offering with them for next week for our celebration for our bishop who goes above and beyond for all of us. And, and I would be remiss if I would not have my wife stand up because on this coming Friday, this woman over here to my left will be lifting her hands in glory, worship, and honor that over 11 years ago, God gave her me and her and me to her. So baby, Friday night is our day. Even though she's got something already planned beside what we could do for our anniversary. But I want to publicly announce it on this coming Friday. 11 years of marriage to this beautiful vessel God has given me. Many have tried, but only one was chosen. So this morning, as we move forward, the Lord has dropped something in my spirit that we're going to be dealing with for the next couple of weeks here. 
I want to deal with a subject that God has given us entitled deception. Deception. If you would this morning, open your Bibles. I'm going to lay a little foundation, but we're going to start this very familiar. The first deception we see in the Bibles in the book of Genesis chapter number three. All of us know the story, but if you would, just rest upon your feet. We're going to read a few verses this morning out of Genesis chapter number three. When everyone has it, just shout, I got it. It says here in Genesis chapter three, verse number one, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said. Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, Ye may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye shall die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Father, we thank and bless you this morning for this word that you're about to speak, dispense, and disseminate unto your people through this, your vessel. I pray, God, that you will let my spirit be silent so that we can hear from thee and not me. Anoint our ears to hear your word, but most importantly, to be doers of your word. And Father, I bless you for those that are here and those that are viewing online, that this word will register in their hearts and their spirits, causing them to seek after you in another realm and another level. In Jesus' name, we praise, glorify, and magnify thee. Amen and amen. When you begin to think about deception, deception is intentional misleading or beguiling, trickery, or using flattery of another. It is the act of deliberately causing somebody to accept something as true that is not truth. In other words, it is someone putting out a bona fide lie and getting people to gravitate towards that lie. When you think about deception, it includes a couple of key components. One is dissimulation, which is the holding, withholding or the hiding of information. And two, the second component is simulation, which is putting out wrong or misleading information. And when you look around the world today, you see deception is at an all time high. You have people nowadays stating things that knowingly is not true. I had a good friend of mine when we were coming up, and every time he owed you money, it was always when that Friday of payday would come. This individual always would sit down on his couch when you come to get your money, and he would throw out some deception to you, talking about, I don't know why they always messing up my check. I don't know why I go to work and they're taking my money. And the deceptionary tactics that he used would, was used to draw people in so that they would feel sorry for him. It didn't work on me, but it worked on some others that were connected to him. Every Friday, it was the same old excuse. But come Saturday night, it seemed like money appeared from somewhere to help him do some things that he wanted to do. But it was the deceptionary tactics that he used to keep from pain, to keep from doing what he was supposed to have done. It threw you off. It kept you off base because he gave you false information to keep you at bay, to keep you at liberty from that which was really the truth of the matter was he spent that money on something else. Now, when you begin to think about deception, there is a key to deception. That all of us under the sound of my voice have used. We all have been agents used in deception. What do you mean by that? Every man under the sound of my voice. We've used deceptionary tactics to get the woman that may be next to us or some woman we've had previously in our life. 
We've used that trickery and that flattery to talk, to woo, and to coo. Now, women, don't look at me and say yes, because y'all have done the same thing as well. You know how y'all use the deceptionary tactics of how you, with your emotions and your feelings. When that man takes you out to eat, y'all deceptive with, uh, to us when it comes to eating. We take y'all to a five-star restaurant, and y'all want to sit there and eat like a little bird. Y'all just say, oh, I just want a little side salad. Give me a piece of bread. Then you go home and you devour everything within your refrigerator. One thing that I taught my four daughters was, I said, when a man asks you to go out on a date, I said, you don't be cheap with him. You tell him up front what you like to eat, where you want to go. If he can't take you where you want to go, he don't deserve your hand for that date. See, so many a times of us, we're so uh, in the place and position where we want something so bad, we'll settle for anything. But you don't have to settle. You let a person know exactly what you want, how you want it, and when you want it. But we've all used deceptionary tactics. But the, thing, the key to deception is getting inside a person's head. See, once you get inside that person's head, it allows you to do three things here. It allows you to be aware of one what they know and what they don't know. See, when you throw it out there to an individual, once you get inside their head, they'll begin to speak to you and talk to you. I tell every man, even tell the women, don't tell all your business up front. You see, you women, what you do for us men when we take you all on a date, we don't have to ask any questions because you tell us everything we already need to know. We sit there at the table. You telling us what John did. You telling us what Leroy didn't do. You tell us everything, and all we got to do is sit back and take mental notes because by sitting there with you, we've already gotten inside your head without even opening our mouth. So therefore, what we can do now is because what you put out to us, we can use the deceptionary tactics to lure and pull you in. The second thing that we find out that you have to be aware of, the key to deception is you have to consider what statements will cause them to grow suspicious. See, the deceptionary tactics that are used, you got to, that individual, he comes aware of the he or she, of what statements that they may know, need to use to get you to become suspicious. So what they do is they hear what you're saying and they work their way around. Think of some of the deceptionary tactics that have been used on you. Some of the things that you wanted to say, they beat you to the punch because they stated it first because they knew you were going to say that. And the third thing is one of the keys to deception is you got to anticipate the questions they may ask. See, sometimes that deceptionary individual sits down and they begin to contemplate and think in their mind what he or she may ask of them. So they've already got a preconceived notion, idea, or question prepared for the answer that you may give or the question you may ask, the answer that they can give unto you. But you see, one of the things I wrote down here is people are complicit in deception because one, they reject the truth, and two, they prefer lies. And if you look in our society today, we got a lot of folk that want to hear falseness and not truth. It's reality today is a far gone thing now because people want to hear what they want to hear. They don't care. You can tell them all day long. The sky is blue. But if one individual gets up and says their sky is gray, they're going to follow after that individual. But here in the book of Genesis, we see here now how the deceptor how he works and operates. That's why the Bible lets us know over in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 6, that first A clause, let no man deceive you with vain or empty words. We got a lot of folk that are deceiving folk by using just saying anything that doesn't have any significance, doesn't have any weight, doesn't have any substance, and people are buying it. Here we see here, in Genesis, the Bible lets us know here that the angel Lucifer, that was the created being, he's now fallen and now he is on earth. Here this individual now that the Bible says that was more subtle than any beast that God had made. When you begin to think about the devil, what God had given him to him, the ability, the looks the charisma, if you will, the mindset, 
He was more subtle than any beast that God had made. And the Bible says here that he comes to Mother Eve, if you will. And he does something here is he says, ask her a question. He asked her the question, yea, hath God said. He comes to her now to figure out what she really knows based upon what was told unto her. And see, that's why we as believers, we got to study to show ourselves approved. Because there's going to come a day, there's going to come a time, there's going to come an hour where the enemy's going to approach you to see if you really know your word. You see, a lot of folk come to church, a lot of folks sit in church, but a lot of folk don't go home from church and begin to get into this word. See, you got to get into this word because you got to fight an enemy out there who knows the word forwards, backwards, upside down, and all around. And it's our job to study, to show ourselves. We got to be that right, that workman that rightly divides the word of truth. See, when the enemy comes to you, if you know your word, you can tell him, get thee behind me. But because many folk don't know their word, they're easily deceived, they're tricked and led astray. Here we see here now how Eve, now he asked her a question. And the Bible says that he, when he asked her the question, this is the first question that was asked in the Bible. He says unto her, yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Immediately what he does is he puts Eve on the defensive. Because he gets her in a place and position now where she's got to ponder and wonder in her mind of what she's been told, if that really true or not. That's how the deceptionary tactic works because it gets you to question what has been spoken to you to cause you to realize or question is this really truth or is this a fabrication that has been told unto me. And so here the Bible says what the good respond to the woman. The woman says unto the serpent we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, mistake number one, ye shall not eat of it truth. But here's where she puts herself in a compromising position. She says, neither shall ye eat of it, lest ye shall die. Neither shall ye touch it, lest ye shall die. See, now what the enemy has done is by putting her on the defensive, he has her now questioning that which was told unto her. Now, what she was told, Adam told it unto her, but being a man, what he did because of the inquisitiveness of the woman, he's, and her questioning him and pushing him and pondering him probably, he told her, look, woman, just don't even touch it. Don't, even, don't eat it and don't even touch it. So what Adam did, he put her in a precarious situation because now he puts her in a place to where the tempter can come and try and test her based upon the spoken word she received from her headship. See, it's a dangerous thing when we as men don't speak what God has truly spoken unto us. When we add unto the word of God, we put our spouses, we put our families, we put our friends, we put those associated with us in a compromising position where the enemy can now come in and cause chaos, confusion in your life. Had Adam just spoken the reality of what God told him of all the trees in the garden, leave the one in the midst of the garden alone. If you touch it, you're going to die. But he, if you eat of it, you're going to die. But he had to put in there if you touch it because he was frustrated with her probably questioning him. We know how y'all women do all of us, but you question everything we speak sometimes. Therefore, our, our emotions, our rage, our frustration sometimes picks up. We just say, woman, just don't do anything with it. Adam here, like all of us men, put his wife in a precarious situation. Because now he puts her in a place where the deceiver now has full reign to operate upon her. See, but now what I like about this is because what you got to understand about deception Deception's power only comes from, to, and through dialogue. So you cannot be deceived if you don't open up dialogue with the enemy or with a deceiver. You know some people out there that all they do is want to trick you, use you, and take from you. But what we do is we give them opportunity to sit down in fellowship and we open up our spirits, our minds, our hearts for them in dialogue to deceive us. There's some people you got to cut off because you know they're not on the right plane. But see, because of the fact that she had dialogue 
with the enemy. She opened up her spirit, her heart, and her mind to now hear what he had to say. See, while you combat deception, is the only way it can be combated is you got to resist it and you got to refuse it. But many a times we don't refuse it or resist it. We open up into it. See, all Eve had to do at this point, what she had to, all she had to do was tell the serpent, God said, I believe it, now get thee behind me. But what did she do? She did like many of us. She just sat there and began to listen. Why? Because what the deceptor does, he comes to you and begins to cause you to begin to contemplate the things that are going to bring gratification and satisfaction to your flesh. Because he began to speak to her and get her to thinking that what God had spoken unto them was it really the truth or reality of the situation. So therefore, because of the fact that what she's now in dialogue, the enemy now has her just where he wants her. He has her in the palm of his hand. All of us that have used deceptionary tactics in the past, once we realize and recognize we have that person right where we want them, now we begin to sink the hooks in deeper and deeper and deeper. And so what happened here? is now we see here how the deception worked with her. He got her isolated and separated. He got her to the place and position now where her mind was totally and solely on what had been spoken unto her. But he has her now questioning the very thing that God had spoken unto her. We're living in a day and a time now where we got heretics out there in the world behind the sacred desk. There is a gospel of inclusion that has taken many folk out of the church of the living God. This gospel of inclusion states that any and everybody you're saved no matter you know it or not. You don't have to do anything or, any, or say anything or do anything because you've already been saved by birth. It's a gospel of inclusion that is straight from the pits of hell. But you got folk running after this gospel. And the thing about it is the man that put it out there was somebody that had a powerful position in the Pentecostal church. But see, it doesn't matter. The devil will use anybody he can to be a deceiver of the brethren. This gospel of inclusion is messing up many people. Because people are believing that I don't have to do nothing. I'm already saved. But where you find out is if, why would God send Jesus to be the propitiation for our sins if the gospel of inclusion was true? But because people don't read their word and understand that we are sinners by birth. We're sinners because of the fact of what Adam did and because of the blood that runs through our veins. We're already, there's nothing we could do except believe receive what God has for us. But the gospel of inclusion said, all I got to do is nothing. And you got folk believing that. But when you study your word, you will realize the deceptionary tactics that are out there. I don't know who under the sound of my voice needs to hear this today, but you got to know your word because the deceiver is on a rampage today. The devil has cranked up his game because he doesn't want to go to hell all by himself. So he'll do any and everything he can to get you out of the clutches, the hole, the fold of the gospel of Christ. But I come to tell somebody today, this is the day, this is the hour that we got to lock in like never before. We got to tell the devil, I don't care nothing what you got to say. If it's not based in the word of God, get thee behind me, Satan. I'm sick and tired of seeing brethren and sisters turn their back all because some charlatan speaks something into their life. And they take that word and run with it. You got to be careful of the words that you allow to enter into your spirit. A lot of things that people are speaking today behind this sacred desk. Some of these folk are speaking doctrines that have no biblical basis. It sounds good. They know how to twist it. They know how to butter it up. Put sugar on it. To get you to thinking what they're speaking is a word from God. But anything that comes up behind the sacred that should be a word that will cause you to seek after the master like never before. But some of the words that are coming forth are causing you to fall within yourself and thinking that you are a God. Because we're living in a day now 
where people now are falling for any and everything. The deception in the land is so strong. Just the other day, a bishop from a Pentecostal organization spoke about we, apostolic Pentecostals, that we are a cult from the pits of hell, is what he stated. This bishop was reprimanded by the denomination that he's a part of. They openly had to reprimand him. But in speaking what he spoke, how many people, because they don't know their word, were affected by it? All because one individual gets behind the sacred desk and allows the spirit of the enemy, the spirit of otherness, to use him to speak against what's in the word of God. So you got to know your word today. Deception is at an all-time high. Everywhere you look, we're being fed misinformation. We're being given half-truths and not the full truth. And what's happening is people are sucking into this. We're seeing left and right how many folk are going to prison because they gravitated to lies that have been placed upon social media. Everything that comes across your TV, you can't believe it. Everything you read in your newspapers, you can't believe it. Everything you see on social media, you can't believe it. But the only thing that you can truly believe is what's written in these 66 books. The infallible word of God. The word that heaven and earth shall pass away. But not one jot or tittle of this word is going to pass away. But deception is at an all-time high. We're going to begin to be dealing with this over the next couple of weeks, deception. And I want to let everybody in the sound of my voice know, it is time for you to get in your word like never before. It is time for you to pray and seek after God. Every time a preacher gets up in the pulpit, you need to make sure what we're preaching, what we're teaching lines up with the word of God. Just don't take it because it's Apostle Shelby. Just don't take it because it's Apostle D. But every word that's spoken, you need to line it up with the word of truth. But what happens is many of y'all don't open up your Bible only on Sunday morning and those who come to Bible class on Wednesdays. So you're a prime candidate for the agent of deception. But I'm going to make it my mindset, my heart, and my spirit. There ain't nobody under the sound of my voice in God's house church. It's going to be a tool, a vehicle that the enemy can come in and deceive, trick, and lead astray. Because we are a church that believes in the unadulterated word of God. We are a church that believes in teaching and preaching, helping you to study to show yourself approved. We are a church that has resources and everything at our disposal to help our believers go to another level, go to another realm. Because we want to see you excel above and beyond. We don't want to see you in the hands and clutches of the enemy. But deception, we're not going to fall prey to deception. Think about, as I'm going to take my seat, all the people that you came into the church with. Where are they at today? Think about those who used to shout, run, scream, and holler around the church. But the enemy used one bit of false information a false truth to get them out there. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day and there's a prophet in the city of Los Angeles, California that's giving folk exactly what they want to hear. Half truths and not full truths. Churches flocking. Flocking with people. I watched something. They told me to watch something online. I watched a little bit. The building he has, he has about six different auditoriums. And he goes through and just either lay hands, pour water on folk, and they fall out. Speak a word. I heard he speak something. I was like, if you knew your Bible, you would have known that ain't nothing truth to it. And the sad thing about it it's folk are leaving the apostolic Pentecostal church where the truth of God's word has been, is being preached and flocking after this. We're in the day of itching ears. 
where folk just want to hear what they want to hear. We're in the day where folk want to do what they want to do. And we're in the day where they've got people who will speak what you want to hear to get what they want. Which is all they want is your Benjamins, your Franklins, and your Grants. But be not deceived, for God is not mocked. Let no man get you with vain words, empty words. But we, the believers, we got to study to show ourselves approved. Most kind, gracious Father, I thank you today for what you have dispensed into my spirit. As we're about to embark upon a series entitled Deception. I pray, God, that as you begin to open our spirits, let us, oh God, gravitate to what you're speaking unto us. For, Father, there are those this morning who the enemy is trying to deceive. But we bind that spirit right now and cast it to the pits of hell. And we speak the true living word of God today. Satan, you're a defeated foe. And we bind you and we cast you, your imps and your demons, to the pits of hell to not torture or trouble the people of God anymore. And I thank you, Father, for this day, for the word that has been spoken, that it will register in the hearts of your people. And Father, those that are in the sound of my voice, as I ask right now, those of you who want it, the truth of God's word, those of you whose relationship and fellowship is not where it should be, you need to come down these aisleways this morning. For the enemy has told you that you're all right, that everything is good. You've heard messages, you heard word that all you got to do is lift your hands and repeat after the man of God. But the word of God declares and decrees, except the man be born of the water and the spirit, he is none of his. And if you under the sound of my voice this morning have not been down in waters of baptism in the name of Jesus, if you haven't received the full indwelling of the Holy Spirit evidence by the speaking of other tongues. This morning the word says you are not one of his. But we don't want that said over your life. You have an opportunity right now to come down these hours and receive the fullness of salvation that's only shown to us in the book of Acts. The gateway to the New Testament church, the book of Acts. You need to come this morning and receive and get all that God has for you this morning. Is there one is there somebody here right now that needs prayer? You know right now you're in the balances. You're teetering. You're wavering because deceptionary things have been spoken over you, spoken to you. But you need one of these prayer pastors to begin to pray, bind, break, dis destroy that yoke, that bondage is over your life. Don't let this moment pass, but come down these aisleways this morning and receive all that God has for you today. As we bow our heads this morning, just minister to the person next to you. Ask them today, are you in right relationship and fellowship with the master? Is your life where it should be with God? If he would split the skies right now, would you be in the number that would go with him? Have you received the fullness of salvation? If you, have, if you cannot say yes emphatically, then you need to come down these highways this morning. You need to submit and surrender to the call. And the day you hear my voice, Harden not your heart. This is the time, the moment of opportunity for somebody to receive salvation, to get your life in right accord, right relationship, to come back into full favor with Christ, to where now you have the ability, the power, to enjoy all the privileges that a child of God has because we are joint heirs with Christ, because he is our father we can share because we've been adopted into the body of Christ you need to come this morning you need to come this morning but Father we thank and we bless you and I pray God that you allow this word to just minister to your people just minister this day in Jesus name we pray amen and amen
praise the Lord. We thank and praise the Lord for that word. We pray that we'll become doers of the word and not just hearers only. Immediately after uh, service here, we will be having communion. If you'd like to partake of communion, please come and sit in the middle section. Also, um, this mark your calendar, all women, on September the 16th, our women's president, elder uh, evangelist Charlotte Walker, will be having a meeting. We'll be having a women's ministry meeting in the fellowship hall at 11 a.m. And we're asked to bring snacks to share with one another. Amen. And we have three areas of giving. For those of you that do online giving, please go to the website in the upper right-hand corner. You can click on giving. You can do Givelify, PayPal, or Cash App. Cash App is dollar sign, God's House Church. Um, and you will see our logo, you know that you're in the right place. And if you're mailing in your contributions, please mail them to God's House Church, 2335 Wyoming Boulevard, Northeast, Albuquerque, New Mexico, 87112. Don't forget prayer here on Tuesday mornings at 10 a.m. Then at 1130, you're able to stream our online Bible study taught by our assistant pastor, Elder Vester Smith. Then we're back in the sanctuary on Wednesday night at 6 p.m. for prayer. And immediately at 7 p.m., we will be having our Bible study taught by our assistant pastor, Elder Damon Shelby. Good, uh, good afternoon again. Okay. Next week, Sunday, we'll be expecting a cultural group during service. They belong, you know, they, they have their doings, you know, at the e read and their association with the church, you know, is through e read Is the Igbo, which is, you know, an ethnic group from Nigeria. Please, please be here. You, you really, really will be entertained. Let's say amen to that. You talk about some singers, these kids can sing. And they're coming here in good numbers. Their parents, they won't be a part of this ministry next week. And we're going to let them sing. And we're going to have our guest speaker. I called him Bishop, but he's Apostle, Apostle White. And he's coming here. He's going to be speaking next Sunday morning. So I want you to bring someone. Amen? Bring someone. Now it's time for us to do what God expects every Christian to do. God so loved the world that he gave. God gave his very best. And when it comes down to the kingdom and supporting the kingdom, God wants you to give your very best. And your very best is not what you think you want to give, but God set a system in place, and that is the tithe system. Many people have been deceived because they don't want to tithe. They don't want to give. But when a person we were talking about in Sunday school having the word of God on the inside and when you have it on the inside it comes out on the outside and when God's love is in you and God's truth is in you when it comes to giving you'll give biblically which is the tithe what is tithe bishop just 10% this $50 that my son gave me that's my birthday present I'm going to put it back for next week but it's an increase I owe God $5 that's the tithe on it and I'm going to pay tithes on it. So I got $45 to myself that, hey, that I didn't have at first. And I'm giving God five. And that five that I give God opens up the windows of heaven that God can pour out spiritual blessings upon you. Saints, let's don't be deceived when it comes to giving. As a preacher said, well, it's in the old covenant. If you know your Bible, tithes was 430 years before the law, before the law. Jacob paid tithes. There was no law. Amen? So we're going to tithe. As you hear me say, when I took over this church, some of you would start buying it. After about the first couple of months, people were coming by on Saturdays and say, are you still selling those pies and chicken dinners? And I said, no. And I found out they were trying to support this church by selling pies and chicken dinners. That's a disgrace to God. God never intended for his church to be taken care of like that. It's nothing wrong with it, but he set in, in place the tithing system. I've been a tither for, after the second year of my salvation, the first couple years, I tried to justify not paying tithes. I hit and miss. 
But when I got truthful with myself, I became a tither and I've been blessed and I'm still blessed and continue to be blessed. With that in mind, I want you to stand right now and get ready for your tithing. Now, right after tithing, we're going to have our communion. So all of you that want to com have communion, you can come right. I forgot. Does anybody want to join the church today? Anybody want to join the church today? These, I forget. We didn't. We give people an opportunity to become a member of God's house church. If that's you, you can come right now. And we'll just receive you if you're here. God's been speaking to you. Father God, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the tremendous message that Elder Shelby preached about deception. And I pray, God, that the devil will not deceive these precious people when it comes to giving. Because as they give, Lord, you bless. You said you would open up the heavens of wind, the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing we wouldn't be able to receive. All because we obey your word when it comes to giving. Now bless those, Lord, that have the desire to give. But Lord, for some reason, they don't have the substance. Make a way for them, Lord, that the next time they come to this service, any service, they'll be able to give kingdom way. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, saints. Uh, will the congregation please stand and face your left and follow the directions of the ushers in the rear? Also, just a reminder that we will be having reunion, uh, communion after and if everyone can gather in the middle. Appreciate it. Thank you. Calling all men next week. We're having our Sunday school class at 10 here in the back. All men, we're having a great class. 